Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert, and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm, I'm excited about this guest that I have on the show today. I've actually known of him for a long time and uh we, we've had some discussions in regards to a particular path that i took um and and also how i've been influenced by his work and also the people who have influenced him uh, and we're going to get into that uh, because it's critically important uh based on some recent findings from uh, a, a study that is quite large in nature across a lot of different or um you know d- different types of people throughout the world talking about emotional intelligence uh, so we have Joshua Friedman on the show. Joshua, welcome. Uh, I lost, lost my unmute button there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So Joshua Friedman was born in Berkeley, California in the summer of love. His parents were both statistics professors, and he has an older sister, Deborah. Their parents divorced shortly after he was born, but remained f- friends throughout their lives. Their dad went on to become the chair of statistics at UC Berkeley, and their mom began a lifelong quest to re-examine epidemiology around reproductive health, an early start for Josh's passion for research. Josh's early childhood was filled with the value vice of growing up with a single working mom, and she was commuting two hours each way to teach at a community college, so Josh and Deb were frequently on their own. Berkeley was a strange but fairly safe place in the 1970s, so even at six years old, Josh was able to take a bus and ride his bike through the city to go to school, uh, and which fostered a sense of independence. And when he was 10, Josh's mom and stepdad Hank were married, and the family was blessed with a baby brother, Christopher. Hank was a Navy veteran who, like so many of his era, era, lived with undiagnosed PTSD. Hank Hank loved the high and wild mountains and taught Josh the bliss of drinking from an icy mountain stream after a long hike through the Sierras or Rocky Mountains. He was an entrepreneurial thinker, and that's probably why Josh ended up starting multiple companies before he was 20. After college, Josh became an educator, and he taught at the Nueva School, um, where he first met Daniel Goldman and learned about emotional intelligence. Dan was researching for what became his best-selling book on the topic and was looking for examples of how people could practically learn these skills. Goldman highlighted self-science, the method he saw in that school, as an almost point-for-point match with the skills of emotional intelligence and one of the only practical processes for actually using the growing or using and growing EQ. In 1997, Josh joined Annabelle Jensen, which was the school's executive director, and Karen McCown, the school's founder, to create six seconds to share this approach. Fast forward, six six seconds works in 150 countries and territories, growing a global network of people with the skills, tools, and support to grow the world's emotional intelligence. Together, the network has reached around 10 million people. Six Seconds works with all kinds of organizations from FedEx to the United Nations and Qatar Airlines to small schools, community organizations, and businesses where people want to be better with people. Josh's first book, At the Heart of Leadership, shows the practical steps to use emotional intelligence as a leader, and his four other books continue the theme, translating the science of emotional intelligence into actionable tools for change, for parenting, for personal growth, and for building organizations where people can be and do their best. Josh is married to Patty Freeman, and they live on the central coast of California and have two adult or young adult children. Joshua Freeman, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Yes, except my light just turned off again. (laughs) I mean, maybe it looks okay. (laughs) Okay, You're fine. You're fine. Uh, Okay. So um, you and I had the opportunity to 
talk a little bit about how we were going to frame our discussion because, I mean, your years in depth in this particular space is quite significant. And you talked about a recent study uh, that was done, and I had mentioned that um, in our in our opening. But if you could, give us a little bit of breakdown and understanding of this study and what the findings were. Sure. It, we've been doing this for over a decade. It's the world's largest study on emotional intelligence. It's called State of the Heart. And this year, we we started releasing uh, some findings in, in July and a little more uh, in August, a little more in September. So we're, um, we're sharing it bit by bit. Um, the study uses a sample from over 140 countries, and it's randomized uh, to bring people in a balanced way from different geographies, uh, genders, um, career levels, so that we can really try to get a sense of what's happening in the world's emotional intelligence. And unfortunately, uh, there's there's some good news, uh, but there's a lot of bad news about what's going on in terms of emotional intelligence and the key outcomes. I, I think most people don't care that much about emotional intelligence until they realize these are the learnable, scientifically grounded skills that we can actually measure. And, and those skills are correlated with increased effectiveness, uh, better relationships, higher quality of life, and well-being. And so when we, we start to think about that from an organizational perspective and saying, well, gosh, what would be the skills that could help people <laughs> be more effective? Well, here we go. To have stronger relationships with colleagues, with with team members, with customers, these are the skills that are are really the difference that makes the difference. And uh, the data is is compelling that uh, that 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 this is this is a path that can really transform our lives individually and organizationally. Well, and here's the interesting thing about what you just said is that we are seeing mainstream a lot of things in regards to purpose, uh, engagement, uh, retention. Uh, a lot of things that for me, if you were to, to essentially just take all of those aside, the, the foundation in all of those really comes back to emotional intelligence. That, I mean, that's what I see. Is that wrong thinking? No. Uh, if we, we understand that emotions exist as uh, a way to motivate us, and to help us pay attention to opportunities and threats that we perceive. And so we have emotion. So from a neurobiological basis, um, we feel things, and particularly big feelings, because we're perceiving a big opportunity or a big threat. And this the, this way of thinking about emotions, that it's called the adaptive theory of emotions, and um, goes back to Darwin and, and looking at animals and how animals have emotions too. And, and these, these emotions are part of our survival function. And as pack animals, social animals, uh, these emotions are signals of where we stand in relationships. So if you think about, you know, organizational leadership from that perspective to say like, you know, you know, that old song, the leader of the pack, like how does, you know, how do you show up in, in relation to the group? And am I in the group? Does somebody have my back? Uh, you know, is there a, a saber-toothed tiger coming? And how are we going to deal with that? And how are we going to, you know, have more of a pack? So all those basic survival questions, emotions are signals of that. Now, a lot of people say, you know, oh, well, we should just be rational and leave emotions out. That, of course, is completely irrational. It's not how the brain works. So when we think about something like, well, finding purpose and purpose at work and people staying engaged and actually wanting to come to work, there's a huge emotional component to that. And I think in many ways, organizations are failing humans. Uh, and that's why engagement is so low. And that failure is largely one of uh, emotion. Okay. And so, so So think about that, where the failure occurs. Hmm. Um, because I mean, we could buy a software and it'll help us with our employee engagement, right? Isn't mm -hmm. that going to fix our problem? Hmm. Well, we can buy software that says it will help us, <laughs> but the data is, you know, I, I remember almost 20 years ago, first reading this employee engagement data 
and seeing that you know only somewhere between a quarter and a third of employees were actually engaged and i thought then wow organizational leaders are going to really take serious action on this because we have a very clear financial case <laughs> here we are a couple of years later and employee engagement is sort of stubbornly the same uh so I think the fundamental issue is that most engagement efforts are kind of dealing with tip of the iceberg. It's like, well, let's send more messages. Let's have better snacks. You know, let's get people, you know, ping pong tables or foosball tables or, you know, video games or whatever they're doing up the street from me in Silicon Valley this week. Uh, and those are things. But engagement is an emotion, and things and emotions aren't the same. Okay, so I think it would also be helpful because Susan Fowler has written a lot in regards to motivation and human motivation and, and the reasons and the science behind human motivation. Uh, and then you start looking at emotional intelligence, and you're like, okay, so again, you know, where's the connection here when we start mm -hmm. talking about you know, a, a emotion and the science of motivation and how that actually contributes or not, you know, to whatever you have from a, an employee engagement perspective. So I like to think about different motivators as different tools for different purposes. So uh, way back, one of those companies that you mentioned that I started was a construction business. And I was a licensed contractor when I was 17. And um, so I had tools in my truck. And if you know, lo and behold, we're nailing some boards together to build a deck and somebody shows up with a screwdriver, that's not fit for purpose, right? There's nothing wrong with a screwdriver. It just, it doesn't really help you put in nails. So we need to understand what is the problem and have the right tool for that. And the same thing is true about motivators. So if what you want is for people to be at their desk at a certain time, or to you know answer a certain number of calls, or to get, go on and you know serve as an attendant on an unpopular flight. Those are behaviors, and you can use behavioral motivators for those. If what you want is for people to care, to connect, to innovate, to solve problems, to share, those are emotional. I don't know, things, their emotional responses. And if you use behavioral motivators, what happens is you get the opposite. So if we say, you know, well, we really want people to care, and so we're going to pay a bonus. And there's a classic example of this. Singapore decided that they really wanted to, have, to change the impression of Singapore. And so they were going to have the employees at Changi Airport smile more often. And they put little mirrors on the computers and they had smile counters. And they had people go around and check whether how often you were smiling. And you got penalized <laughs> if you weren't smiling often enough. And so, you know, you start having people doing this behavior of smiling. And it's like, ha, huh, what are you doing here today? What, what, you know, what's your purpose? Do you have your purpose? And that like you get this very transactional, emotional interaction. You have the behavior of the smile, but you don't get the emotional impact that you were looking for. So wrong tool for the job. That's a, a behavioral uh, tool for an emotional job. And if, if what we think about as we think about leading people, engaging people, supporting people, if we want an emotional response like, like caring or trust or innovation or problem solving or collaboration or engagement, we need to use emotional tools and well, how do we develop emotional tools? We grow our emotional intelligence. Okay. So we've kind of hit on the whole engagement piece and some of the things that we may do in order to be able to affect it. Um, and we talked about the whole, you know, purpose, purpose at work, purpose within an organization. Uh, give us a little bit more insight into purpose, you know, and how that actually can be a force multiplier for us. So we call it pursuing noble goals, and which is a little bit of an unusual uh, way to describe purpose. But 
the notion that you feel something that is calling you beyond yourself. And one of the unfortunate findings in the new data, um, and for those of you watching, I'll just share my screen for a second here. Uh, we can see a big drop in scores in Pursue Noble Goals, Intrinsic Motivation, Exercise Optimism uh, during the early part of the pandemic. Now, it's just starting to recover a little bit between 21 and 22, and hopefully 23 continue to go up. But this loss of purpose, this loss of sense, a noble goal is uh, a purpose that's beyond you, and pursuing it is how do I put that into action on a day-to-day -day basis? So if we feel that sense that, okay, this is what really matters to me. This is why I'm doing whatever I'm doing. People are phenomenally able to work hard and sacrifice and do hard things for things that matter. And I'm sure everyone has experienced this, right? You're like, oh, I really want X. It's really important to me. And, and you work incredibly hard for it. On the other hand, you have something where you're like, yeah, I think it'd be good to have X. And you just don't. You know, you don't dig in. And when things get get hard, you change. So that sense of like what actually matters, because like leading is hard. Uh building a, a healthy, strong, profitable, sustainable organization is very hard. Navigating the complexities of our day-to-day -day lives is hard. Building healthy relationships is hard. So why are we going to do those things? We need to have some reason why we're going to do that hard work. And if we don't feel that, and if we can't have that sense that, you know, in some ways my work is supporting this, this why for me, this goal for me that matters, I'm not going to work that hard. And yet when people do feel that sense of purpose, they're magnificently able to dig in and, and connect and solve problems and, and go beyond what's comfortable. Well, so I think that I think this is you know real foundational to you know, getting better results. But as you're saying that, I also have to go back to the whole. If you look at skill development and the process that that takes, I would dare to say there's a lot of fits and starts and a lot of bumps in that initial road. Um, and uh, even though I start doing that exploration work and I start finding a particular connection, I start inserting self-limiting beliefs to say, "Oh, but I don't want to do that." Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I need to be able to essentially get an understanding of how that transformation process works. So if you could uh, help us kind of through how that, that would actually take place. So I think what we're talking about is connecting the dots for ourselves, for employees, for our friends, for our children, whoever, connecting the dots between this work that we're doing and the impact that matters. And I think in a lot of organizations, I think one of the reasons engagement is so low is that in a lot of organizations, it's very hard to see that line of sight between the work you're doing and the meaningful impact that it has. Uh, in terms of our own growth, uh, we did a fascinating study on emotional intelligence. I got curious about this question of what happens when people start to develop emotional intelligence? And, and Jim, you've experienced this yourself. Uh, what we found is that the first stage is this ha-ha where people realize, oh, if I change my feelings and my thoughts, that will help me change my actions and that will get me better results. And kind of blinding flash of the obvious, right? Like if you change what you're doing and how you're showing up, you might get some different results. But it's really important for people to see and feel that. So when they do that, that brings them into this path of uh, that we we found in that in that research study. The path what what where people got stuck is they got overwhelmed. They got there was too much to do. It felt too complicated. It was. <clears throat> maybe too abstract or and the people who persevered what they said is they could feel emotions supporting their sense of purpose and that uh, we called it a path calls was that that stage where people start to feel oh it's not just a nice to have it wouldn't just be nice for me to become more self-aware being more self-aware is part of why i'm on the planet 
showing up more carefully. It's not just nice. It's, it's who I really want to be as a human being. And when we start to make that connection personally, that the path calls, it's like pulling us to, to go through the discomfort, to go through the challenge. And I see the same thing organizationally as well. When organizations have that aligned sense of why we're doing this work, uh, that's when they will take action and, and go beyond the surface level. When it's just like, oh, somebody said we ought to do an emotional intelligence training. They do it. They're done. There's no real benefit. Well, even though as you're saying that, I started if I, if I start looking at it in comparison to say um, somebody who um, is plays a particular sport and has athletic ability, mm-hmm. um, you know, you have some kids that aren't very coordinated at all. So they're at a very very different starting point than somebody who already has some coordination and some athleticism. Seems to me as you're talking, we're going to find the same thing occur when it comes to emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence skills and the awareness piece and the, you know, you know, the overwhelm and how I address overwhelm. I mean, you have all of this uniqueness uh, that's tied up into being able to get to the point, you know, to where that, you know, we have good collaborative relationships and, you know, we're serving customers, you know, and, and there's not a lot of inconsistencies that essentially everybody wants to you know, do better, you know, at their job and wants to stay at it. Um, so I would dare to say that there's some people much like, um, I think I had given you the um, story before where I had somebody who was a frontline leader and he was in his sixties, but he was unwilling to do anything different in order to, you know, help his people develop. So at that point, I would think as an organization, we need to make a decision. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to get them out of a leader role if they're not willing to actually make those, you know, make those changes that are re- that are really required in order for us to get to that point. So I think part of that can be on the bus. I think part of that, Jim, is <clears throat> do we even know what a leader's job is? Right. And are we are we aligned on that? And I think a lot of us kind of play leader. I a lot of my coaching clients, I hear them say, Well, I say, Well, like, why are you doing that? And they say, Well, that's what managers are supposed to do really who said you know but like there's this sort of archetype uh and there's an archetype of being strong and that archetype by the way is kind of rooted in patriarchal uh norms and colonialism and racism and like maybe it's time in what year is it now 2023 for us to rethink what strong looks like and to say, like, a strong leader, does that mean you're stoic and tough and don't show who you really are and boss people around, you know, and put people in their place and, you know, they just do what they're told, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think that's where we are in the world. And if that's not where we are in the world, maybe we need to redefine what it means to be a, a good leader, a strong leader. Well, okay. So then, as you're saying that, again, talking about what's in mainstream, we talk about vulnerability, we talk about transparency, we talk about, you know, the, those things that are associated with, you know, being more human and being more empathetic and, and all of those things. But it, it seems to me like that that's not necessarily, you know, where I need to be redirected towards either. I mean, there's, there's, you know, this, this hybrid or this blend, you know, of being able to be, you know, confident, because mm-hmm. we know that when we have confident leaders, people will follow someone who's a little bit more confident than wishy-washy, in- insecure, um, you know, n- d- doesn't have much self-confidence um, in their decision making. So it's like, okay, so how do we find this blend in this hybrid that's going to fit for an organization? Yeah. Again, I go back to what are we trying to achieve? And so... Um, to, to switch up our metaphors here, if we're playing pool, I'm terrible at pool, but I, I'm I'm good enough at pool to know that I hit the white ball, right? All you do in that game is hit the white ball, right? <laughs> like that's the game, you hit the white ball. So that's the only action you can take. But how you hit that white ball and kind of where you aim it changes what happens next. And if you're trying to get the blue ball in the corner pocket, you hit the white ball a particular way. If you're trying to get that red stripey one over in the side pocket, you hit it a different way. So what are we trying to achieve in an organization? And if what we're trying to achieve is compliance, then maybe we 
you know, hit the white ball a particular way. If what we're trying to achieve is is innovation, maybe we need something really different. And and I think a lot of times in organizations, there's a lack of kind of thinking through culture as part of strategy, saying, here's how we're trying to create value in our organization. Here's where we are. Here's where we're trying to get to. And therefore, what we need in our, our leadership, what we need in our culture is this. And therefore, what we need in our, our, our leadership is this. And <clears throat> when I've gone down that road with senior leadership teams over and over and over, we, in the last decade, the answer has been, wow, we really need to be, we need people, people. We really need leaders that build a connected culture. We need our employees to feel that sense of belonging. We need our employees to feel psychological safety. We need them to want to be here, not just clock in and out. And, But that may not be true in every organization. So what are you trying to achieve, whether you're you know, a strategic leader or an operational leader or a frontline leader, what are you trying to achieve? Or, or maybe what you're trying to achieve is to become a leader or avoid becoming a leader. But whatever it is you're trying to achieve, then step back from that and say, okay, what are the, what are the leadership tools? Uh, what is the way of approaching this that's going to help me move towards where I want to go? Okay, so as you're talking, uh, I start thinking about uh, the opportunity for an individual to be able to execute upon that goes back to what you were talking about. I get to this piece and then I get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if I start thinking about this, what I refer to as retrospective engineering, meaning, uh, hey, this is where I want to go, that's backward you know, plot that, think that, connect dot, you know, let's look at the, you know, all the dots to see what we need to connect in order to be able to get there. Um, it, it would have to be a concerted effort. I mean, you couldn't one off it. Mm -hmm. that'd, that'd be one thing. Uh, and then the other thing is knowing that it's going to be a journey that mm -hmm. never ends. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this now full time for over 25 years and I feel like on good days, I really bring my, my emotional intelligence. I really bring it, but uh, it's still not consistent for me. In that study that I mentioned, where where we were looking at what happened as people started to develop emotional intelligence, it took three point seven five years on average for people to say they'd really integrated the skills into their day to day work and life. And so there is a piece about that that concerted effort. The, the good news is it's very easy to start. Like in you know minutes, we can we can say, okay, here's what it would look like for me to start using emotions in a more intelligent way. And I'll tell you, the very first step is to start seeing emotions as resources. Instead of seeing emotions as something kind of random that's happening or disruptive or destructive, every emotion, even the complicated, messy ones like fear and overwhelm and, and jealousy, even those ones, they're resources. When we start seeing them as resources, we start tuning in and getting that data. That's the first step. So what I'm hearing you saying is I have to learn how to be a little bit more analytical in my thinking in regards to emotions and behaviors. Yeah. I mean, again, a visual here of getting our, our, our head and heart, our brains and hearts. It's not like we've sort of been in this space of of head over heart. And we're not saying, no, now let's go heart over head, right? It's like getting them to work together. And in that partnership, like even something like naming an emotion, again, at a neurobiological level, literally what you're doing is you're bridging these different parts of your brain that felt experience a cognitive center that we use for words. Uh, I'm feeling a little worried and also a little excited. Okay, bang! You just did emotional intelligence because you're you're bridging these different parts of that felt experience and those words. We need both of them, and we need to we need to not kind of hold one of them above or below the others, but say how do these things work together? How do we be smarter? with feelings. 
Okay. So I'm also thinking, um, cause we had mentioned and talked about behavior, uh, in, in our ability to be able to make the transformation. Um, even when we started reading your bio talking about, you know, the behavior elements of you growing up, divorced parents, a uh, mom, you know, commuting two hours. I mean, all of those types of things you therefore had created certain behaviors from an emotional perspective because of, you know, that environment and that upbringing uh, that formulated a lot of the things that you had done or did not do. Yeah. Um, and, and I would dare to say, if you start looking at how sooner kids are getting to expose to different perspectives and information because of smartphones and things like that, um, it has led into you some with, you know, some of the findings in regards to this report that it's now we probably even have a bigger job at hand uh, in yeah. order to make a difference in emotional intelligence than we've had before. Would that be, would that be fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. The, <clears throat> the way we usually think about this at, in my organization at six seconds is um, a competency that we measure and we talk about as recognizing patterns. And a pattern is our learned typical reaction. And our brains are, are pattern making, pattern following machines. Our brains love patterns because they're efficient, they're easy. We don't really need to think. It's, it's autopilot. And so we perceive something. And then if we, if we have a pattern that we can follow, we save a lot of energy and a lot of time by just going on autopilot. The pattern when I feel X or when I think X or when I do X, um, I typically then go to Y. And, and we use this in a triangle, thinking about our feelings and our, our actions and our thoughts and noticing um, how do those actions and how do those thoughts and how do those feelings, what have we learned as our typical way of reacting? When we start to notice that, so you know, you were talking about how you know, like I learned at an early age, if there's a problem, um, I need to go fix it. So when I perceive a problem, I take action. As a CEO, that's a very problematic pattern because my job as a CEO isn't to go and fix things myself. My job is to support a context where people can figure out the problems that need to get solved and solve them. Um, so noticing that pattern for myself and noticing the emotional driver of it, because there is a piece about discomfort, there's a piece about worry that kind of gives me a lot of energy to go after that and, and try to make it better. When I can notice that and notice my own frequently recurring pattern and then say, wait a minute, is that serving me? And are there any other options? So I said step one was noticing the emotions, getting that data. And this is really step two is stop and say, wait, is that getting me where I want to go? So I notice that that feeling and the reaction I have, and then I assess and um, consider, are there other options that might work better? And can I expand the range of options? And then the third step is to go. <laughs> so it's like reflect, stop, go. So I, I would dare to say, um, when you look at the the study, when you look at the work uh, that you have compiled and amassed over the past, you know, couple decades in regards to emotional intelligence, um, we have to act and do some things a little bit differently. What do you see that those are? Uh, well, I think there's a sort of set that ha are more organizationally oriented and there's a set that's maybe more socially and personally oriented. Uh, but the common ground is about uh, rehumanizing. I think we've done a lot of dehumanizing of our workplaces and of each other. Uh, you know, social media is sort of a prime example where we, where it's not really people, right? It's a post. And, and it's not a feeling that we're conveying. It's a reaction button that we're clicking. And rehumanizing our workplaces, I mean, we've we've lived now for 
100 plus years with the logic of let's leave emotions out of it and just be rational and have this kind of mechanistic factory oriented approach to work. And we can see the result. We can see the result in bad decision making and disengagement in kind of a very short term oriented thinking. This rehumanizing um, with ourselves, I think, is a, a lot about connecting with our own emotions, connecting with others' emotions, feeling that sense of shared humanity. And for myself, when I can feel that, and it's it's not always, but when I can feel that, it helps me understand the situation much more clearly and to, to understand my part in it much more clearly. And again, whether that's in, in my role as a leader or role as a dad or role as a human being, that felt connectedness, I think, is uh, it's really the pathway that's going to allow us to create some of the shifts that we need to create in our, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our, in our societies. Okay. Um, when you started talking about um, the historical nature of how we go about our work, uh, all of that has somehow been tied into our educational system. Yes. And uh, the if you start looking at the traditional Western educational system, it is let's make good workers who can mm -hmm. basically focus and do 10 hours of work a day, you know, and get the work done, you know, versus, you know, being the knowledge thinker versus being the creative thinker and the innovator versus the problem solver versus because, I mean, if we start looking at the a level of creativity that exists in the workplace that has been mm -hmm. declining at a at a increasing rate you know for many years and we talk about r d we talk about innovation we talk about the need for that um and that uh, you know i guess america will actually grow its way into world prominence again through the doorway of innovation okay but if we're not creating a lot of you know effective you know creative and innovative thinkers that's never going to mm -hmm. happen um, so if, yeah. if I start looking at, you know, that particular issue and what we have to overcome, what does an organization, you know, now have to know what's in the workplace in regards to, you know, what's coming out of the school systems and what I need to do differently versus what I've done before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could have a whole conversation about education. I, I, one of, I, I teach in two universities, um, in, this topic and educational leadership and the role of emotions and emotional intelligence. And um, there's a lot going on there. Uh, from the workplace perspective, we have people coming into the workplace who are by and large, the product of this system that's very transactional, very externally focused. Your worth is kind of based on the evaluation from somebody else and your ability to comply with that. I remember reading a, a fascinating um, article from um, somebody in HR at Google who was talking about trying to find good Googlers. And they tried all kinds of different ways of hiring that were really no better than randomly random selection. Uh, grades were not a good predictor of being a good Googler. And this person's hypothesis is that grades are based on people showing up and solving the problems that have already been solved. And like, you know, your teacher sets a problem and now you have to figure out the teacher's answer. And at a company like Google, they're interested in people who solve problems that haven't been solved. So I think that that, that place of saying, well, are we hiring people who are good rule followers? Are we are we hiring people who are obedient? Or are we looking for people who are actually motivated? And are we, as we look at the first few years that somebody's in our company, is their experience one of, you know, you are a, essentially a, a flesh robot, you know, and do what you're told and show up and just follow the protocol? Or are you a person with ideas that we value and a life that we value and that we actually care about each other? <laughs> Those two paths are going to create a really different manager in a few years. And um, one of them is, you know, that's sort of 
the more transactional approach seems easier. But again, you know, as we talked about earlier, what do we actually want? And if we want our a more human and humanized experience of work and more thoughtfulness and more caring, we're going to need to kind of tolerate or even welcome a little bit more of the messiness and complexity. And, you know, actually, when we say to employees, like, hey, like, what do you think about this? And they tell us things that we don't like, <laughs> we're going to actually have to be willing to have that conversation and not just say, you know, do as you're told. Very good points. Okay, so we talked about the study. We talked about a book and several several other books. Uh, we talked about uh, Six Seconds, you know, as, as a nonprofit organization. Uh, yeah. And talking about all the work that you've done throughout the globe. But when I started looking at all of these things and where you are currently right now, I started asking myself, well, what is one of Joshua Friedman's goals? Hmm. <laughs> I would love to put myself out of work, <laughs> both organizationally, you know, and thinking about how do you build an organization that's going to be doing its important work in 50 or 100 years? And I've been thinking a lot about that um, in this stage of my career. And how do you grow that capacity? But also, I mean, ideally, we would have a more emotionally intelligent world and our organization could could close or go on to do something different, right? So um I'd like to I'd like to put myself and my organization out of work. That would be one goal. Um we have for the past 25 years, really focused on growing people with deep expertise in emotional intelligence. We have partners around the world who have very serious capability as coaches, as consultants, as facilitators, as educators to grow emotional intelligence. And now we've started to see how do we leverage these incredible experts that are in our network all around the world and the opportunities that exist. So for example, we have a partnership with UNICEF. And with UNICEF World Children's Day, we have the ability to reach millions of children. And, and we have. Um, we've had thousands of volunteers participate in this project. It's entirely free. It's happening, in fact, in 200 countries and territories. And um, you know, how do we do more of that? How do we take this capacity that we've developed over the last 25 years and connect people with how do you actually bring that practice into the world, in communities, in businesses, in, in schools, so that we, we really start to shift this tide uh, and reverse that graph that I showed you earlier? Well, and the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the home day hoedown. Okay, Joshua, the Hump Day Hold On is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions. Your job is to give us a robust, yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Joshua Friedman, are you ready to hold down? I am. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Uh, gosh, <laughs> quick answer to that one. Uh, my first answer is myself. Uh, and... Um, really being willing to, to stand out for what I stand for. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Um, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? I am pretty optimistic, even uh, given the mess that I see in the world. I really believe in people and that we can make things better. And what would be one book you could recommend to our Legion? It could be from any genre. Hmm. Well, I recently reread The Wizard of Earthsea, and it's really a gorgeous uh, set of books by Ursula Le Guin. And um, I read it as a kid, and uh, reading it again as an adult um, was a lovely experience. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net and doing a search for Joshua Friedman or Josh Friedman. Okay, Josh, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only take one. 
So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I've grown a lot of empathy in the last 25 plus years and uh, come to really understand that empathy is a superpower. And I think I was afraid of that when I was 25 and I'm not now. And I wish I could take that back because it would help me build uh, even stronger and more powerful organizational and personal relationships. Josh, I had a great time chatting with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? LinkedIn is great. Um, or you can go to sixseconds.org and visit our website. We have tons of cases and articles and free information and interactive tools, as well as training and uh, other resources if you want to dig in and grow emotional intelligence and join us in getting it to be everywhere in the world. Joshua Friedman, thank you for sharing our knowledge and wisdom and helping us all get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 